Now this morning as we get into uh, the word, I got to give you a, a fair warning and give you a little bit of backdrop. The message I'm preaching, yes, no, maybe this morning. Uh, this doesn't happen to me every week. I mean, I kind of wish it did, but it doesn't really happen this way every week. Tuesday night, I got woken up in the middle of the night and God just, boom, just dropped a message, dropped a scripture in my heart. I mean, it was like clear as day. I couldn't hardly sleep a wink the rest of the night. And so that's sort of the, the message I'm going to preach this morning. It has been brewing in my heart, given by the Lord, like, like in just one of those kind of God moments for me earlier this week. And so um, we have been, if you've been around, we've been going kind of more systematically through the book of Acts this summer. And we're going to break from that this morning. We're going to actually be in the book of Revelation this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 3, we're going to be talking about the church in Laodicea this morning. And just feel like God just has a powerful word, but I'm going to warn you, uh, this is also one of the hardest messages I've ever, uh, ever preached. And so um, just really praying that the Holy Spirit's going to get a hold of our hearts this morning. Revelation chapter 3, are you ready? And are you there? Almost. I hear, I got a yes, I got an almost, but we're going with yes. Here we go. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Holy Spirit, right now, over these next few moments, I make it my prayer that you would be the one to speak. Lord Jesus, I just sense you love this church and love these people so very much today that, Father, sometimes out of your love, you've got to discipline us. Sometimes out of your love, you've got to challenge us and rebuke us. But, Father, that doesn't change your love. It's unwavering. May that be so evident today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Bible says right there in verse 19, Jesus says, those whom I, I, I rebuke, I love, those who I love, excuse me, I rebuke in discipline. Those whom I love, I rebuke in discipline. Hebrews 12, 6 says essentially the same thing. He says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens everyone he's, he accepts as a son. How many parents know sometimes the most loving thing you can do for your children is to discipline them, Right? One of the most loving things I can do for my little two-year-old Sierra is to smack her on the hand and give her a firm no when she's about to reach up and touch that hot stovetop burner, right? She's right at the age right now where she can start to reach those things and she's curious and she's starting to get into things. And so the most loving thing I can do in that moment when I start to see her hand go up for that stove is to smack her and to give her a firm no. Now she's not going to like it. Right? She's going to walk off. She's going to cry. She's going to suck her thumb. She's going to give me a sour look in that moment. She is not going to want anything to do with her daddy in that moment that her hand gets smacked. But how many know that she will have a lifetime of being grateful to me as her father for having done that? Every time she doesn't burn her hand, she might not think of it quite in those terms, okay? But as she goes through her life not burning her hands on hot oven burners, because I as a parent know if I let her touch that, the consequences are severe, maybe even permanent. And so I've got to, I've got to lovingly discipline. And I believe in the same way that 100% the firm rebuke that Jesus gives to the church in Laodicea, it is absolutely given to them out of love. 
100% out of love, I believe it is, that the Lord wants to, to give us a challenge today. We've got to remember, this is a letter that's given to the church. Right? This is not a letter that's given to unbelievers or, or, or those that are, you know, are running from God or have rejected God. This is a letter that's being given to the church, the very bride of Christ. And so his love for the church has never wavered. We read that earlier this morning from Romans chapter 8. There's nothing that we can do to escape his love. Now his approval of their lifestyle might fluctuate, but that doesn't change his love, right? Let me say that again. The approval of the lifestyle may fluctuate. He might not be thrilled with the actions an individual or a church is taking, but his love for them does not waver. That being said, Jesus' message to Laodicea, undoubtedly one of the most somber and pointed messages in all of the Bible. There's seven letters that, that the book of Revelation uh, gives us. And of those seven letters, they're found in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Of those seven letters, all six of the previous letters, this is the seventh one, all six of the previous letters have some good things to say. At least, at least something good to say that, that commends those churches, some positive reinforcement regarding their activities or their lifestyle. Now, some of the churches, there's not much good to say, but it's something good. We get to letter number seven, the letter that we just read to Laodicea, and it's the only one of the seven that, that the Lord gives them nothing good. There's no commendation that he can give them that say, well, here's what you're doing well. And it, what's interesting is that I believe if you were to interview the church at Laodicea before they received this letter, I believe if you were to inter interview their leadership or their, their, their attenders at that church, I think that they probably figured they were doing a pretty good job. I think they were probably of the mindset that they were, were actually, they would have given themselves good marks. And this is evidenced by what we read in verse 17 where, where Jesus says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Have you ever been the last one to know something about yourself? Okay. You know, this is like, it's 8 o'clock at night, you stand in front of the mirror and you see that big old hunk of spinach in your teeth, and you're like, wait a second, I ate spinach like 8 hours ago at lunch, and it's 8 o'clock now, and this is in my teeth, this has been in my teeth all day, and then you start thinking about the, the meeting that you had with your boss, or the meeting you had with that potential client, or the conversation you have with that really cute person down in marketing that you were hoping would take you out on a date, right? And that hunk of spinach was there the whole time. You're thinking, crud, no, I wish I would have known. I wish somebody would have just told me the truth about myself so that I could have I fixed the problem. And instead I've gone through and now I'm like the last one to know. The Bible says that essentially that's what was happening in the Laodicean church, that that they had this major spinach in their teeth, and they had the bad breath to go with it, but they didn't know. They did not realize, they were unaware, didn't have a clue that they were wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, the great irony here is that probably to the casual observer, actually Laodicea looked like maybe even one of the strongest of those seven churches. Because Laodicea, as we kind of study the history of it, Laodicea was, was, of those seven churches, the most financially prosperous. Laodicea wasn't experiencing a lot of the, the intense persecution like some of the other churches like uh, Pergamum and Smyrna, Philadelphia. Those churches were experiencing intense persecution. Okay? To the casual observer, it looks like Laodicea has actually got it pretty good. In, in modern times, I believe like Laodicea would be the mega church that you drive up to that has the really nice building and cars in the parking lot, and, and top-line technology in their service, it has all the look of some place that has it going on. But, and let me just say, there's nothing wrong with having those things. There's nothing wrong with having a nice building, technology, cars in the parking lot. In fact, those can be indicators that there is something happening. Sometimes you see those things, and it shows you that Jesus really is doing work. But how many know that having those things doesn't automatically mean that God is doing something great in that church, that there can still be something wrong internally in that church. 
Jesus looks at Laodicea and he says, you're too blind to see the truth about yourself. Your bodies, your physical bodies, no riches. You know what it's like to have a lot of money, but your souls are in poverty. It reminds me of the words of the Lord to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, the, the Lord is about to anoint David as the future king of Israel. Remember this story? And now, and now Samuel has come and he's called, summoned Jesse and he said, bring all your sons, right? And now they're, before they get to David, David's the youngest one. All the older sons come first, right? And, and it starts, his oldest brother is Eliab. And the Bible says Eliab is like this physical specimen. And Samuel's thinking, this has got to be the guy. This has got to be the king. But what does the Lord say in that moment? He says in verse 7 of 1 Samuel 16, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Right? The Lord looks at the heart. And we've got to remember, church, that God is, is never, has been, never will be, is not fooled by the outward. He's not fooled by the, the show that we might put on. We might be fooled by our own appearance. We may be even fooled ourselves with our own appearance, but God is not fooled. Laodicea thought they were doing just fine, but Jesus said, you're too blind to see it. You've missed it. And unfortunately for Laodicea and any churches that are, are like her, the consequences of this are severe. Jesus says that because of this condition of lukewarmness, he says, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now, the word spit, that the NIV translates that word into spit, and many other uh, translations use the word spit, but spit is actually a very weak usage of the actual word there. If you read the, the Greek, the actual word is the word emeho, E-M-E-O, emeho, and by definition, it means to vomit, okay? This, so this is not spitting like you got a little gnat stuck in your own, tuh, 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 spitting it out on the sidewalk, okay? This is like I'm retching, right? I'm revulsed. I'm sick to my stomach, spewing out vomit. You say, that's gross, Pastor. Right? Jesus said it, okay? <laughs> you can take it up with him. He's the one that said it. That's the word he used, is to, to vomit, Okay? He said to Laodicea, your lukewarmness, your tepid nature, it's so revolting to me, it makes me want to puke. You say, well, why? Why, why would Jesus say that? Why would, why would Jesus say that? I mean, that doesn't sound very loving, does it? That doesn't sound very accepting. It doesn't sound very tolerant of Jesus to say that. I mean, I mean isn't the fact that they were lukewarm, isn't that better than being ice cold? Isn't it better that they were at least partially, partially for the Lord? I mean, there was something in the tank. Isn't that better to have something in the tank than, than, than to have nothing at all? I mean, yeah, maybe I'm not a sold-out Christian, but, I mean, what about all those people that aren't even trying to live for God? God, are you really saying in this passage that you would rather have me not even trying to live for you ice cold than to have me just partially warmed for you, lukewarm? For you. And, and I got to confess, for years I wrestled with this. As a young man, I wrestled with this. I thought, God, this doesn't make sense. I would think of it to me, I would think of it in terms of food. I would think, God, I just know me. I would much rather eat a partially warm slice of pizza than one that's been sitting around two days ice cold. God, I know I would rather drink a partially warm cup of coffee than, than one that's the pot that's been sitting there all day and is ice cold. God, I don't get it. And then one day it clicked. It, it, it just something clicked and I began to understand that the person or the church that is willing to settle for lukewarm living doesn't really understand the true nature of grace. The church that, let me say that again, that, that is willing to settle for lukewarm living doesn't really understand the true nature of grace. Let me explain. Grace, of course, is how we're saved, right? The Bible says it's by grace that we're saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 clearly says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that none can boast. Right? How many know we can never, ever, ever deserve grace? Right? There's nothing we can do to earn grace. Grace. By definition, grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. We, we don't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't accumulate enough good works to, to somehow get it. 
There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's available to anyone and everyone, regardless of the condition of your heart. The person that you and I might perceive as being so far from God, the grace is just as available to that person as it is to you or I. We get that, right? Okay? It's a free gift. But how many know, though it's a free gift, it will cost you everything? It will cost you everything. It is free, but it will cost you everything. Jesus says in Luke 14, 7, he says, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It'll cost you everything. You got to pick up your cross and carry it. Or Jesus says, you can't follow me. The truth is, is that God's grace, though it's free, it deals in extremes. It's actually a very black and white proposal that God's grace gives us. And probably the best explanation of this scripturally is found in, in Romans chapter 6 through Romans chapter 8. Now, we're not going to read all of that because that would take us like 10 minutes to read just that, that passage alone. Okay. In fact, here's some homework. Go and read Romans chapter 6 through Romans chapter 8 sometime after the service, not during the service, okay? Just go, go read it this week, and you'll, and you'll understand. But let me give you a couple of excerpts from Romans chapter 6. I want you to see the extreme nature of grace, okay? Romans 6, 2. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Romans 6, 11, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 3 and 4, And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8, 10, If Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Are you seeing the extreme degree that that God goes to when you become a Christian? When When you say yes to his grace, he says, here's what's up. You're dead. Your old man, your old sin nature, it's dead. It's not hanging around anymore. It's not just, you don't just keep it in your pocket in case you feel like pulling it out again. It's dead. It's dead. There is just not examples in Scripture of God putting up with half-heartedly following. They're not there. You won't find them. Of God saying, it's okay to just half-heartedly follow me. God is looking for full commitment or no commitment. That's why he uses terminology like death to describe the finality of what happened when we said yes to Jesus. This is why in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus, he lays it out for this guy. There's this guy, he wants to follow him. He's trying to pursue Jesus. And so, and so, but the guy says, you know what, Jesus, I want to read it. He says, another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. In other words, I want to follow you, but I got this thing with my dad. He's dying, and I got to, let me bury him, and then I'll follow. There's delayed commitment. Verse 22, but Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus said, listen, you want to follow me, you're going to, it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to leave some things behind. In his, in his book titled Not a Fan, Kyle Eidelman writes this. He writes, I suspect there are a lot of people who feel okay about a half-hearted relationship with Jesus because they have every intention of one day going all in and being completely committed. They don't feel convicted about not following Jesus because in their minds, they know that one day they will. They let themselves off the hook for a lukewarm faith because they didn't tell Jesus no. They're just waiting till later. That man in Matthew 8, he didn't tell Jesus no. He said, I want to follow you, but I got to take care of this first, right? It's not no forever. It's just no for now. I'll be along shortly. The the powerful grace of Jesus, church, looks for a, a clear and timely response. He's not pleased with a church or an individual that says, I'm partly in or even not, not even pleased with the one that says, eventually I'll get around to being more fired up. Eventually I'll embrace you and follow you wholeheartedly. Yet in many ways, if I may say so, that is exactly what the, the church of 2015 has, be, has been about. What Christians of 2015 have, have tolerated. We've become in many ways like Laodicea, half-heartedly invested 
half-heartedly invested in our faith. I'm going to just, I'm going to be partially invested, but I'm not fully invested. We're like the, the, the zombies that our culture is so obsessed with right now. We're, you know, dead or alive, who can tell? We're not really sure if they're dead or alive. They're just kind of going through the motions. And, and actually, the description that Jesus gives of Laodicea, it, it's not all that dissimilar from the zombies, right? He says, well, you're wretched, pitiful, poor, naked, and blind. Right? A, a church that's full of people who aren't fully committed to following Christ. The church of 2015 has, has begun to mirror the short poem that was written uh, once by a man named Wilbur Reese titled $3 Worth of God. The poem goes like this. He said, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a warm cup of milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love a black man or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. That's come to describe where a lot of people are at. Francis Chan, in his book Crazy Love, words it this way. He said, let's face it. We're willing to make changes in our lives only if we think it affects our salvation. This is why I have so many people ask me the question like, can I divorce my wife and still go to heaven? Do I have to be baptized to be saved? Am I a Christian even though I'm having sex with my girlfriend? If I commit suicide, can I still go to heaven? If I'm ashamed to talk about Christ, is he really going to deny knowing me? He goes on to write, to me, th these questions are tragic because they reveal much about the state of our hearts. They demonstrate that our concern is more about going to heaven than about loving the king. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command, John 14, 15. And our question quickly becomes even more unthinkable. Can I go to heaven without truly and faithfully loving Jesus? Francis Chan ends by saying, I don't see anywhere in scripture how the answer to that question could be yes. And so friends, I want to ask us, each one of us, a very difficult question this morning. And you can either truthfully and introspectively answer this, or, or you can take the easy route and breeze it over and go along your merry way. And the question is simply this, are you sold out for Jesus? Are you sold out to Jesus? Are you 100% in? Because I got to tell you, Jesus doesn't settle for less than that. He doesn't just say, well, okay, it's okay. I'll take 75%. That'll, that'll be good. That's okay. No. By definition, Jesus says to him, there's no such thing as a lukewarm Christian. Jesus doesn't acknowledge the fact that there's such thing as a lukewarm Christian. That's an oxymoron in Jesus' book. Doesn't make sense. And so I would ask you, are you sold out? Now, don't be, so, don't, don't be too quick to dismiss that question. Have I settled for a lukewarm Laodicean version of my faith? Am I, am I asking some of those same questions that were posed by Francis Chan? Am I asking some of those same questions that basically say, God, how close can I get to the line without going over it? Can I, I still want to qualify for heaven, so that's the line. I don't, want to, I don't want to cross that, but God, what can I get away? Can I drink? Can I watch horror films? Can I use foul language? Can I, you know, can I, can I, can I be pro-choice? And we try and set up our camp as close to the fence as possible so that we're not too radically different from the world. Is that, is that where we are? And if it is, the Bible says we need to repent of that. The word hot that Jesus uses, remember he said, you're neither cold nor hot, right? That word hot in the Greek is the word zestos. Okay? It literally means boiling hot. Okay? Boiling hot. Jesus' definition of hot, we should make that clear. It's boiling hot. It's white hot. I don't know if you've noticed, but boiling hot and lukewarm are radically different. Right? And really, what I, what I, when, I, when I read that this week, when I discovered that this week, I thought, you know, God doesn't, not only does he not want you lukewarm, he doesn't really just want you like slightly above lukewarm either. Like, well, I'm not really lukewarm, but like, I'm just like, kind of like warm or like I'm hot. No, he says, I want you boiling hot, boiling hot. That's why 1 John 1, 5, we're told this. John writes, this is the message we've heard from him and declared to you. God is light 
in Him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. And then just the first two verses of chapter 2, he goes on to write, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. John says this. He says, look, here's the deal. Don't sin. He says, don't sin. You, he says, you should not be okay with sin. And if you're, and if you're sinning, he says, if you're sinning and, and you're just pretending like it's okay, then you're lying to yourself. And you're, and you're lying to God. If you're just pretending like that's somehow okay. He says, walk in the light, right? Walk in the light. Walk boiling hot. Right? Walk to that extreme. Don't just settle for the middle of the road, but go to the extreme. And, 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 and then if you stumble, notice he says if you stumble, not when you stumble. John looks at sin. He doesn't give sin to be a given. Okay, there's a teaching, by the way, that has kind of, kind of been just infiltrated the church that just makes people feel like they assume like, well, I'm just a sinner. Listen, I read my Bible, and, and my Bible doesn't say when you sin, assuming that you're going to sin. If you sin, okay, if you sin, then, John says, here's the good news. You have this advocate in Jesus. Aren't you so thankful that you have an advocate in Jesus, okay, if you sin, okay? But I would, I would encourage you, let's shift our mentality from when I sin to if I sin. When I sin to if I sin. I don't want to sin. I want to reject sin. I don't want to ever get comfortable with sin. I don't want to be comfortable with the fact that, that it's okay to sin. It's not okay, okay? The Bible's so clear about that, but isn't that what the church has become, comfortable with sin? Do we still hate sin, or have we started making excuses for why it should be tolerated? Why it's, why it's now somehow okay? Well, we've come to our senses, and we're more sophisticated, and now it's okay to do the things that used to be called sin. You know, it was being comfortable that got Laodicea in trouble too. Being comfortable with their position was what got them in trouble. I'm not going to bore you, I hope, <laughs> with, the, with the history. Now, to me, it's fascinating, so it wouldn't be boring, but some of you would find history boring, so I'm not going to bore you with it. But let me just summarize Laodicea by saying this. There's a lot of historical references that indicate that Laodicea was wealthy, well-dressed, and healthy. Okay? They're wealthy, well-dressed, and healthy, okay? The source of the city's wealth was two primary things. One was the world-renowned black wool industry that, that came out of that city. So they had a black wool industry. They were well-dressed people, okay, if wool was their primary industry. The other primary industry that came out of there was their world-famous eye powder that was used to cure a variety of eye ailments, okay? So Laodicea was literally, you look into it historically, they were considered like a retirement community. This was the place that people went to like live off of all of their earnings and be healthy because they had good health care and they had fine clothes so they could live fancy schmancy, okay? It was where you went to just coast to the end of your days. That was Laodicea, okay? But many people believe that it was the the prosperity of the region that actually ended up subduing the Laodicean church because, bluntly stated, the people in that church were afraid to risk the comfortable lifestyle that their riches provided them. They knew that if they began to stand up for their faith and began to take a stand boldly, uh, spreading the gospel in that region, that perhaps, perhaps they would lose out on some of the riches, the financial riches, the worldly wealth. Maybe they saw what was happening in the church of, of Acts chapter 4 when people were financially sacrificing to the point that they were selling off property and giving all the money. Maybe they saw that and got scared off. Maybe they were like the rich young ruler that Jesus interacted with in, in Luke 8, 18. Remember him? Jesus said to him this in verse 22. He said, uh, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and 
you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Verse 23, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Couldn't leave his money to follow Jesus. Have we in America this land of great affluence? Great affluence. You realize, don't you, that probably every person in this room is richer than 90% of the world. Even the poorest person in this room has more, so much more, infinitely more than so much of this world. Have we gotten so comfortable in this land of influence and in our rich lifestyles that we've lost sight of who God has, has, has been calling us to be? Have we sometimes, even as churches, shied away from declaring the truth, keeping things PC so that we don't offend big givers? And by the way, I don't want to shame anybody for being uh, affluent. We don't need to be embarrassed about the fact that we're blessed, a nation that's blessed financially. Praise God we're a nation that's blessed financially. That's not to shame anybody and say, well, we should just go all be poor. That's not what the Bible teaches, okay? But the, the, the question is this. Have we become like Laodicea in the fact that, that our money is now our God? that our money is now more important to us than the things that Jesus is calling us to? Have we chosen our money over Jesus? Let me ask you this. What if Jesus asked you to go all in? What if he said, give it all away? What if Jesus said, I want you to leave your salary and move to the mission field? Could you? Would you do that? Would I? That's a question for me, okay? But when we're all in will Jesus, with Jesus, then listen, when we're all in with Jesus, He's got, he's got everything. It's all his. We give it all to him. In our hearts, it's all his. Our home, our car, our family, our time, our money, our, our talents. Jesus is yours. And if you want to use it, you want to take it, and, and you want to leave me with nothing, or you want to send me to the mission field to live off a, a, a small amount and just scratch out a living, but I'm doing it for you, then God, fine. It's your call because my life is completely Yours And so let me ask again, can we say with integrity that all we have belongs to Jesus? And I would ask you or counsel you, don't answer that question too quickly because Jesus himself has told us, count the cost. He may actually take you up on your offer for anything. <laughs> and that's a scary proposal. Now here's the good news. For Laodicea, for us, that if we've gotten lukewarm, as the musicians come this morning, if we've gotten lukewarm, there's hope. Verses 19 and 20. We already read verse 19, but I'm going to read it again. Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. He goes on to say, so be earnest and repent. He says, here's your option. If you've fallen into this, it's, it's time to repent. Here I am. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they will eat with me. Jesus, in his love for his church, continues to knock earnestly. Though they only half-heartedly received him in Laodicea, though their lifestyle left a foul taste in his mouth, nonetheless, Jesus knocks. Why? Because he does not desire to spew them out breaks his heart to see them wretched, pitiful, poor, naked, blind. And so he keeps pursuing, keeps pursuing. But in that pursuit, he's not going to change his standard. He's not going to suddenly say, oh, you know what? You're right. A little love, is, a little love from you is better than no love at all. No, he's got, a, got a, a standard that says this. You're going to follow me. It'll cost you everything. You can do it for free. You can't earn the right to do it but it will cost you everything. You can pursue me, but only if you do it wholeheartedly. Only if you do it wholeheartedly. Let me just ask across this auditorium if we can close our eyes without anybody looking around. I know, church, I know this is a a little bit more of a fiery message than maybe you're used to out of me. But I feel like it's an important message. And I want to give opportunity this morning for honest, truthful introspection. Are we in this room 
saying, you know what, Pastor Ryan, if I had to describe my Christian faith, lukewarm would actually be a really good description. I'm not all in and I know it. Now, look, we've all got areas of our life that we're working on. Okay, that's not what this is about. We all have areas that we're, that we're, we're fighting through and we're growing in. Okay, I'm not saying the standard is, well, you have to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, you're lukewarm. Okay, don't, don't walk away with, with that. I understand we're growing, we're maturing, we're developing. Okay, but is the spirit of God convicting you right now to where you would say, you know what? I know in my heart of hearts, I'm not fully committed. I only do this, this Christianity thing halfway, partway. I'm a Sunday Christian. Maybe that's a description of your life. You're a Sunday Christian, but you know, Monday through Saturday, you just do whatever you want. Is that really the version of following God that you think he's calling you to? Now listen, it's a, it's a big step that God is calling us to this morning. He's saying, I want you white hot, boiling hot. I want you so on fire. That's the nature of grace. And by the way, grace did us a favor by killing that old man because that old man, that old sin nature, all it did was get you in trouble anyways. That was truly gracious that God says, let's get rid of that guy. Okay, that was grace at its finest, but it's extreme. You're here this morning, you say, Pastor Ryan, I feel like, like this is a message for me. I feel like God's calling me to repentance. I feel like God is calling me to acknowledge a lukewarm lifestyle. And I want to be white hot. Would you just re- slip up your hand where you're at this morning? And I want to pray for you right where you're at. Hands all over this auditorium. Thank you, Lord. Just allow the Holy Spirit to just bring conviction to your heart right now. Holy Spirit, we just pray for right now for holy conviction, not condemnation. God, that this is not a message of condemnation, but Lord, it's a message of Holy Spirit conviction this morning. God, it's through your love. It's through your passion for your people. God, that you cannot sit idly by and watch them live lukewarm. God, you know too much. God, you know God, you see that lukewarm life and how it can damage us, how it can destroy us. God, how it's just one step removed, God, from from completely giving up and walking away cold. God, you love us too much to let us do that. God, for each one of my friends and, 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 and brothers and sisters in this room, God, that have slipped up a hand. God, I thank you that, Holy Spirit, you've brought conviction to their heart this morning. And Lord, I pray right now, God, as they've slipped up a hand, that there would begin to be a transformation. God, as they just begin to repent. God, as they begin to acknowledge. God, that they begin to identify. Lord, that they have allowed themselves to become lukewarm. Lord, you've got so much better for them so much better. God, I pray that right now you would begin to rekindle that fire, rekindle that excitement that they once felt. God, move them out of their comfort zone. God, forgive us that we've allowed ourselves to get comfortable at times. It's easy enough to do, but God, it's wrong of us to do that. May we not just get comfortable, but Lord, may we stay white hot. God, we know that when we live our lives white hot, there's going to be trials. We know that there's going to be people who don't understand. We know that there's going to be temptation. We know that there's going to be people who try and convince us that we're too radical or too extreme. But Lord, you've called us to the narrow road. Help us to stay on it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, help us to hate sin. Help us to hate sin. God, forgive us that we've become comfortable with sin. God, that we'll hate sin. God, we don't have to hate the sinner. We should love the sinner, but God, help us to hate what sin does to people and to not just turn a blind eye anymore. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, listen, I hope you know, I just 
love this church. I just think you're awesome. God loves this church. He thinks you're awesome. Okay, please don't walk away today feeling like, wow, Pastor Ryan's down on us. That's not it at all. Okay, man, this is an awesome church and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Now let's go out there and live white hot. Live boiling hot for Jesus. Love you, church. Pray that you have an awesome, awesome week. Blessings. We'll see you next Sunday.